Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, let me start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is uh, Mohsen Saad. Uh, I serve as the university chair on the CFA Society Emirates. I'm also a professor of finance and the associate dean at the School of Business Administration at AUS. I'm extremely delighted to be with you tonight. I take this opportunity to thank you for attending the first session of a new initiative that we call the University Series Presentations. And this is the first, hopefully, of many to come. And this new initiative is done such that we caref carefully select topics that we uh, that are current, that are uh, frontier and of extreme importance. The initiative is meant to provide for you learning experiences so that you can add to your stock of knowledge, of skills, so that you're improved and general level of competence is higher. Um, uh, it is also an event that is tailored for students like you uh, or professors in some cases uh, at CFA affiliated universities in the Arab United Emirates. Uh, through the CFA Institute, we can tap into speakers of world standards with great achievements. And with us tonight or today, it depends, uh, is Matt Orsar. Uh, who is uh, the Senior Director of Capital Markets Policy at the CFA Institute. Matt has uh, generously uh, agreed to talk to us tonight about exciting topics such as ESG integration in equities and fixed incomes, the different barriers facing integrations and some of the suggested solutions. And these, and many, many more. Matt will go about his presentation. Uh, until he ends. So, and then when the conversation, when the talk ends, uh, Matt will be taking the questions in the form of QA. If you are uh, wanting to have a thought or you would like to ask a question, then you can put that in the chat box or you just simply can wait until the conversation, the, to the presentation ends, and then you can have a conversation. Now, uh, we are extremely delighted to have you, and we're looking forward for a um, for an engagement, for an uh, for an environment in which both of us talk. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to ask questions, and uh, it would be uh, less than perfect uh, not to hear you out. So we're, we're very excited about that. And without further ado. I would uh, welcome Matt, and uh, once again, I think I thank Matt so much, and I will leave the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. Thank you, and thank you everyone uh, for coming today, my morning, your evening. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the the, the current state of ESG integration uh, in the investment process and how how that can be done. Uh, we only have an hour, so I can't touch anything. Unfortunately for you, I'll give you a lot of homework and other resources uh, to, to look at outside of this time. <clears throat> and as was just discussed, please uh, come, come with uh, questions and discussions. I've, over the past 18 months, I've probably done 100 of these type of webinars, as we all have. And it's more engaging when it's a conversation than just, just me talking. Uh, but so I will just talk me for, for the next half hour or so. Uh, and then hopefully we'll get into a more robust discussion. So let me share my screen. This is always an adventure. I think I've got it now. How's that? Does everybody see that? Are we good, Motion? Okay. All right. <clears throat> we, well, I'll, I'll save that for a second. Uh, a couple of years ago, I will, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background about myself. I've been in the corporate governance in the ESG world for about 20 years. I started at a corporate governance rating firm uh, in New York, Governance Metrics International, about 20 years ago. And that was subsequently bought by MSCI and is now part of the MSCI <clears throat> suite of ESG information. Uh, during that time, I was getting my charter, uh, CFA charter. Uh, and in 2005, I joined the CFA Institute itself. And I've been doing work research and writing and speaking on corporate governance and ESG information ever, ever since then. So that's a little bit of a, my background. A couple of years ago, <clears throat> we saw ESG being considered more and more in the investment process. And we wanted to take a, a, a more detailed dive into what was behind that and what was going on. And I'll get into what we found in, in a little bit. 
but where we stand now on the ESG information is, is you know, ESG material, ESG information, and I'll get into material, what's material, what's materiality a little bit later. Uh, but we have an official position on ESG integration because thought, we thought it was important to have such. Uh, you can find this on our website. This is just a brief summary. You can find, it's, I think it's a two-page on our website. But material ESG information uh, can be part of the investment process. Uh, and it is the fiduciary duty of our members to consider all material information in making an investment decision. And sometimes ESG information is material. In that case, uh, it, it is part of someone's fiduciary duty to include it in the investment process. To look at this more systematically, a couple of years ago, we partnered with PRI uh, and we went around the world, uh, back when you could go around the world, uh, and held uh, 23 workshops in 17 different markets. Uh, we came out with these reports. <clears throat> the, flat, the, the first report I'm going to talk most about today, uh, guidance and case studies for ESG integration. We partnered with 31 different firms around the world to get into how ESG integration is done. Uh, the other three reports are regional uh, in the Americas, EMEA, and, and the Asia Pacific. And they each begin the same. The first third of them is looking at what's generally how ESG integration is and isn't done and what we found. And I'll get into that in the next couple of slides. And then each of those reports breaks down what we found in, in the major markets uh, in, in those reports. All told, I think these reports are about 500 pages. Uh, so I don't expect you to read all of them, but they're set up so you can go find what's pertinent to you. Uh, the case studies, there's some equity, there's some fixed income, there's a, and I'll co cover a couple of these in the presentation. There's a sovereign case study or two. <clears throat> and then in the regional reports, you know, if you're interested in what's happening in the United States or, or Canada or Japan or, or China and so forth, uh, you can find a lot of that information and see the trends of, of what things, uh, what things are, where things are going in ESG. These came out about two years ago, but uh, there's still purpose in saying, we'll, and we'll get into some of the prescience of this, these reports as well. Um, what we found is that people find the guidance and case studies the most useful because that really gets into the how do I do this? How do I integrate ESG into the investment process? And I could sit here and, and preach at you about how that's done, but it's really easier to see how, how someone does that, uh, whether it's equities or fixed income, whether it's emerging markets or developed markets, whether it's engagement or, or some other uh, type, of, uh, of type of integration of ESG. So you, I'm not saying you can tune me out for the rest of the presentation, uh, but you can if you like. Uh, but I really behoove you to, to, take, to take a look at the case studies because there's a lot of rich information in there. And one of the things we found traveling the world talking about ESG is there's no one best way to do ESG integration. And if you go back to those reports, you'll find 31 different ways people, you know, these firms do ESG integration. They all tend to have their proprietary process. Governance is the ESG factor that matters the most with environment and social catching up. <clears throat> um, but each firm has their own sauce, secret sauce of kind of how, how they do things. Uh, they have their own uh, internal scoring mechanisms they use. They use data from Sustainalytics or True Cost, and they look at SASB and the TCFD and other resources. But you'll see each of them has their own way of doing things. So it's unfortunate there's no one magic bullet of, of uh, one formula we can all default to to integrate ESG in the investment process. Uh, and in this case, I, I, I tell people it's more art than science integrating ESG in the investment process. And we as analysts and portfolio managers need to understand the landscape uh, to really an analyze properly what's going on in, in the sectors and in, in the companies we're following. Uh, we surveyed uh, everyone we talked to. Uh, this was at the end of 2017. Uh, and it's really interesting revisiting this right now because we asked a question of, uh, how is ESG uh, or how are ESG issues impacting share prices? And then we did the same question for bonds, uh, bond yields. And, and but the, the, the results were similar. So I'm just showing you the equity slide here. And 
the gray bars are governance. How is governance impacting uh, equity prices? And the dark gray bar is 2017, but we also ask the question, how do you anticipate governance impacting equities five years from now? And we're just one year away from that time right now. We're in 2001, end of 2001. End of 2022 will be about five years since from when we first did the survey. And then social issues are the, the dark orange and the light orange. Dark orange is 2017, light orange is 2022. And then environmental, the dark green is 2017 and the light green is 2022. And you'll see that people anticipated uh, the E and the S catching up nearly in many cases uh, not in every market, but in many markets, the ENES catching up with the governance is in, in importance in the investment process. And we've seen that play out, played out, especially with issues of, with like climate and, uh, and natural capital. We've seen those E scores or e, the importance of E in the investment process uh, really jump up. So it's interesting that this prediction was made you know, through our survey of members around the world and investors around the world five years ago, that they saw these things are starting to be important, but they're gonna become more and more important. And that's what we've, that's what we've seen. <clears throat> Talk, we asked folks about the barriers to ESG integration. And this, is, and this was you know, four years ago. Uh, and so these things hopefully have gotten better, but the, the, these are still the top barriers. A limited understanding of ESG issues, and how to integrate the ESG and the investment process, hopefully, with this presentation today and then some of the resources I'll talk about, you know, that, that will help with it with that problem. Lack of comparable historic ESG data. This continues to be an issue. This is it's getting better, but there's still you know a lack of uh, you know of material ESG data in a lot of places. Now, a lot of regulators and policymakers are addressing this issue. That ES, uh, the, the SEC in the U.S. is due to come out with. Recommendations for disclosures are on climate and ESG issues uh, in the next month or so. The IFRS Foundation made an announcement at COP26 <clears throat> that they're going to be coming out with their own global standards to kind of set the baseline of ESG disclosures. Uh, and then the lack of company culture is the third one. And the two different bars are just the dark is fixed income and the light is equities. Uh, but these were the top three answers across the board. La by lack of company culture, it means there's not a there's not a culture of integrating ESG in the investment process at that firm, you know, that, that the people answering the question were about. Um, and those continue to be, you know, you know, some of the main barriers. And we hope in the, in the intervening years, uh, that's, that's gotten a little bit better, but these are still some of the challenges we hear about. To look at the breakdown of barriers across the globe, you know, limited understanding of ESG issues, you see the green circles tended to be the highest with uh, lack of company culture in the blue uh, and, the, you know, and then lack of historical and comparable ESG data in the orange were the top ones. Uh, but you can see, you know, in different markets, uh, different things were important. To give you a tool uh, and start to give you some tools of how to better integrate ESG into the investment process. Uh, in, with PRI, we worked on, um, we came up with this diagram. Uh, we, we affectionately called it the colored donuts because we'd seen it so much and worked with it so much through the process, editing process. Uh, and it's interesting that this is now something we see a lot in, in presentations. It's in the, the ESG curriculum that the CFA Institute has. We have a separate ESG curriculum and uh, the colored donut has made it in there as well. But this is a picture of what firms can be doing uh, to integrate ESG in the investment process. Uh, these, are kind of, these are kind of everything you can do. And the inner circle, inner light blue circle is more research. Uh, and then the orange is you know, security valuation. Uh, and the outside are different things, scenario analysis, risk management, portfolio construction, and asset allocation. And so, if you're a small firm with a couple people and your resources are limited, you can look at this and see what are the things that we can be doing, uh, picking from this menu, if you will, uh, to better integrate ESG into the investment process. And a larger firm that has dozens of folks around the world integrating ESG into the investment process may be able to choose all of these or most of these. But when we analyze different markets, we found that 
for the most part, not all, all firms uh, were doing all of these things. And I'll just give you one example. At uh, the United States four years ago, and this isn't every firm, of course, but this is in the aggregate what we see people doing. And you compare this to what, you know, this is the blue uh, orange and like to what we could be doing. And this is what we're seeing on the scenario analysis, risk management, and asset allocation. There wasn't a lot going on in the U.S. at that time. And then in the you know, in the research, a lot of that was covered in the light blue that's inside that. Uh, but there's a lot of gray. And of course, the gray here means that that's something we didn't see firms doing in that market. And if you go look through the reports uh, that we did, you can see whether it's the Netherlands or Japan or the States or, or China or, or the UK, uh, there's parts where things are great because we didn't see firms doing that for the most part. But this is a, this is a great tool to kind of set the baseline of, of, okay, where are we? What things are we doing? What other things could we be doing to better integrate ESG into the investment process? And this is in the reports and you can find this, you know, anywhere online as well. So it's easy to find as a tool to use. Now I'll talk a little bit about some of the examples, uh, the case studies. And again, we talked to 31 different firms. <laughs> some of them, I think two of them did two case studies. So there's 33 case studies in here. Uh, uh, and uh, we think it's just a, a really good resource. And I'll get into climate change a little bit later. Later, we did a report on climate change last year. Uh, and we put out 10 case studies around climate change last year, and we're doing five more this year. So there's more case studies out there you can use. Uh, this first one was just uh, RBC Global Asset Management looking at a healthcare provider. Uh, and this is just you know, a summary of their report. Of course, the report is about three to five pages in the, in the, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the case study report itself. Uh, and they did scenario analysis and they looked at an upside ESG asset scenario where there's value generated from, uh, from assets through the use of big data analytics. Uh, and then a, a downside scenario, uh, assuming you know, there's a data breach uh, and it impacts the business uh, and it takes a long time for that firm to recover from that. Uh, and they were looking and they were engaged, at the time they were engaging with the firm uh, on that issue about uh, cybersecurity because this this was a, a bit large healthcare company that, that had a lot of proprietary data. Uh, and I think uh, there at the time there was a there was a breach at another healthcare company. And so that was a, a big S issue uh, for, for their ESG analysis. And again, you can get more detail on the case uh, by, by reading it uh, in the case study report itself. So that's equities, uh, one focusing on bonds from PIMCO. And this just gives you a little bit insight into their process. You know, as I said, there's no one way to do ESG integration. Uh, and all the firms we talked to had different scoring systems that they used. And you can see here, 15% uh, of the, the rating they use is based on environmental, 25 is social, and 60 is governance for the, for the bonds they look at. So they overweight governance. And this is their heat map of where in these markets, things are strong or, or weak. The red means weak. Uh, so, and you know, you can look at an issue sustainable, you know, in environmental in the UK, for example, sustainable lending impact, environmental and sustainability plan and green bond issuance, those are all pretty strong. Whereas in Australia, in the social, uh, there's, there's some issues. And so by walking through this case study and these examples, you can see, well, this is how for bonds, PIMCO does it, you know, looking at the way things, the way things mostly on governance with a little bit of social and environmental, and so your firm or any firm can adjust a model like this depending on what you need. And finally, this was a sovereign uh, bond case study uh, done by Colchester Global Investors. I believe this was on uh, Russia. Uh, they did a, a macro analysis. They look at the fiscal position. They look at debt, external position. But then that's you know, the traditional analysis they do. And then they also look at governance, social environment environmental. Um, for governance, they looked for institutional strength, business environment, control of, control of corruption, government effectiveness, human development, demographics, social and political stability in the social, and environmental disaster risk management, resource governance, and sustainability. 
and then you can see how they score those things uh, and and, uh, and adjust uh, their original. They have an original score, and then they adjust that valuation based on ESG factors. And if you go into this case study, you can see the original um, valuation they have, and then they adjust that. I think they they adjust it downwards a bit because some of the the E and the S challenges that they see. And so, if you go through. You know, each case study, you, you'll see most of the firms start off with um, analysis that's fundamental analysis that most of us are used to. And either at the end of the process, they add an ESG screen or the ESG screen is baked into the fundamental analysis, but it's used as a scoring system and they're looking for material information. And by material information, we mean something that a reasonable investor wants to know and thinks it's important to knowing. Uh, to, to evaluate that uh, investment. To continue with a little bit of the tools, talking about the tools, uh, this is a tool I find very useful. This is the SASB materiality map. SASB recently uh, merged and now they're a value reporting foundation. Uh, so you can find them under uh, through either search. But if you look for the SASB materiality map, this is what you'll see. And on the, the column, the white column on the left are different issues. Uh, and the top one's environmental, the mid middle social, then human capital, and so on. But let's look at you know the, the, the first line going across. I don't know if you can see it on your screens, but that first line going across, that row going across is greenhouse gas emissions. And then you can see the different sectors or the columns, consumptions, financial, healthcare, infrastructure, and non-renewable resources, and so on. And where there's a red box, that's a material issue. It's likely to be material for more than 50% of the, the companies in that sector. And so you see the red for greenhouse gas emissions on non-renewable resources and transportation, which is understandable, that's expected. Uh, and then the kind of orangish yellow color is issues likely to be material, uh, but for less than 50% of the companies in that sector. And then the white is it's not, uh, really material at all in most places. And so for greenhouse gas emissions, that's financials and healthcare. And you can go down to different issues as an analyst uh, and, and think about, and this helps you frame, what are the issues I should be looking for? What are the, what are the material um, ESG issues I, I should be concerned about? Another, uh, another great resource is, is uh, TCFD, Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures. Uh, and this is on climate, but this, this framework can really be used in a lot of ESG issues. It's just for TCFD, it's focused on climate. But they focus on governance. How is that company governing, in this case, climate? Uh, what's governing the issue, tackling the issue? Strategy, you know, do they have a strategy of, about you know, what to do about it? Uh, what is that strategy? How do they communicate that strategy? Risk management. How are they managing that risk? You know, and that's in this case, that's climate risk. But you can see how this structure can be used for, for really any ESG uh, issue. And then metrics and targets. How do they measure it? You know, what gets measured gets managed. How are they measuring with climate? There's scope one, scope two, scope three emissions. Uh, and then how are they communicating that uh, to investors? And we found that a lot of investors are using this as an engagement tool uh, on climate with companies. But as I said, it's a, it's a great tool to use for, uh, for other ESG issues as well. In fact, I'll get into this at the, at the end of the presentation, but the, the task force for nature-related financial disclosures uh, is just starting up. Uh, they started up this year and they're looking at, of course, you know, issues beyond climate, although climate is, of course, a biodiversity, or a biodiversity and natural capital issue as well, but whether it's water or fisheries or pollination or timber or any natural resource, uh, they are using the same framework of governance, strategy, risk management, and metrics and uh, building their structure as well. But I'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, a little bit more on climate. Uh, last year, I wrote a report on climate change analysis and investment process. I'll just go through it quickly. Uh, but it, it, it gets to some of more of you know, it's the E, it's the big E in the ESG issues. We talk about how climate change just very briefly, and climate change explains the physics and the chemistry of what's going on, uh, economic and market implications of climate change, uh, physical and transition risks and opportunities. You know, those are the headline things we see. What are the fiscal risks? Uh, and then transition risks to a lower carbon economy. Uh, price on carbon, carbon markets, how carbon markets work, 
a little bit about scenario analysis. It's one of the strongest tools firms are using uh, to integrate climate analysis and the investment process. And you saw scenario analysis from, you know, in the case that earlier uh, from RBC, but you're seeing more folks using uh, scenario analysis. We did a survey of our members uh, to understand what they're seeing around climate. Uh, and what we found there is that about, about three quarters of uh, those we surveyed, I think it was about 78%, said that climate was important, very important or an important issue on the survey was done last year. Uh, but only about 40% of those surveyed said that their firms were, were integrating climate into the investment process. And so that's the same kind of gap we saw with ESG years earlier that people thought was important, but the expertise wasn't there. And, and, and finance is playing catch up trying to integrate ESG in the investment process. It's similar, <coughs> excuse me, it's similar with climate. About 78% say it's important, but only about 40% of firms at this time last year, and I'm, I'm sure that has increased, uh, were integrated in, into the investment process. And then finally, we have 10 case studies, uh, which I think is, is probably the most useful thing to investors. Uh, and, you know, Take a look at the report yourself if you wish. There's the title, Climate Change Analysis, the Investment Process. Uh, but 10 case studies, uh, different ways people are integrating climate analysis, the investment process. And we're, we, we're releasing five new case studies this year. We've already released three. We'll release two more by the end of the year on climate. And the recommendations we make for the climate report, uh, carbon markets uh, help us efficiently allocate capital around climate. Right now, about a recent Credit Suisse report that came out a couple of year, a couple of weeks ago, said that only about 22% of carbon emissions are in any kind of carbon market uh, right now. The EU is the biggest one. China just started one. There's one on the East Coast and the West Coast of the United States. Zealand has a market and we, we would expect that to grow in the coming years. Carbon price expectations, including in analyst reports. It's interesting. This is something we weren't really seeing when we started this report. But just the Credit Suisse report I mentioned uh, that came out two weeks ago was, you know, had a huge section of carbon price expectations and what that means for industries. And we expect to see more of that going forward. Increased transparency around uh, carbon, uh, and that gets back to the ESG discussion we're having before about the need for more and better data. Uh, engagement with companies. I talked about the TCFT model, that it's a great model for engaging with companies on climate. But as I said, that model can be used for engaging on other ESG issues as well. Education and profession. I hope we're doing some of that today. And I hope the case studies we did uh, helps with that. Uh, investors having more seats at the table uh, on issues of policy and regulation. We're the ones who are gonna be allocating capital, uh, whether it's an ESG issue or a climate issue. And so it, it behooves us to, to be in the conversations with policymakers uh, around regulation and standards. I talked a little bit up front about materiality. <coughs> and the important thing about ESG data is what's material, what's gonna make an impact. We thought this was important enough to do a report on. Uh, we're in the late stages of putting together one now. Um, we may be talking about that uh, next year, but expect that in early 2022 for us. A little bit about double materiality and dynamic materiality. Uh, it's, it's something we're starting to hear more about. Uh, the, the, the classic materiality we're, we've heard about in the ESG world is how an environment impacts a company. You know, they need resources, whether it's human capital, whether it's timber or whatever it may be, that that company needs resources uh, to, to, um, to make their products or services. And so the first financial materiality we're, we're more uh, akin to hearing about is that how does a firm's environment impact that, that, that firm? But the other arrow in double materiality is how do firms, how do companies impact the world around them? And are, are there ways that those are negative externalities, you know, climate change being the oil and gas being, you know, the classic one or a thing like smoking and its impact on the healthcare system. You can think of a lot of different ways where companies have impacts, negative and positive. There are positive feedback loops, of course. Uh, but considering that more uh, in the investment process because that, that second arrow of double materiality 
our long, long-term issues like ESG issues tend to be uh, that we need to be considering as, as analysts. And finally, talking about materiality, uh, dynamic materiality. And the, all that is, is understanding that what is material will change and evolve over time. Right now, you know, last week just ended COP26 and no one's denying now that climate change is material, a huge material issue. But 10 years ago, that wasn't the case for most folks. And 20 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, it wasn't on a lot of people's radar. And what's, done, what's material will change and will evolve with, with culture, with regulation, uh, with in, investor interest. And so materiality, unfortunately, isn't static. And then finally, I just, just I, I, I find what's going on with natural capital very interesting. And I see it as where we were with climate change a couple of years ago. Uh, here are some, just some resources to, to think about. <clears throat> the Economics of Biodiversity, the Das Gupta Review is a great paper. Unfortunately, it's 600 pages long. Uh, so I don't expect you to, to read it all. I haven't read it all. I've read most of it, but the, the last 100 pages are just footnotes. It's so long, but there is an executive summary uh, that you can jump into. But it gives a great overview of where we are with natural capital and some of the issues we need to consider. Uh, the, the big stat that jumps out at me from that paper is that uh, we're using the resources of Earth as if we had 1.6 Earth, Earths to use. That of course isn't sustainable. And so how do we get that under control from an investor's point of view and policy point of view? And, and that will drive change in the coming dec decades. Uh, the TNFT, as I mentioned, is looking to be the TCFT, but for natural capital, keep an eye on what they're doing. Uh, and then just the natural capital protocol is a, is a kind of a primer for, for integrating natural capital in the investment process. And I see, and as I said, this is the very early stages and, and uh, if it's, you know, people jumping into the natural capital world uh, will be ahead of where people are two or three years from now. And I think this will be the, the, the type of issue that climate is now. Um, before I finish, uh, this is my email address. Uh, we only have about 20, 30 minutes left. So, so if uh, you do want to bother me, uh, feel free to do so if you have any questions that, uh, that we don't answer today. Uh, also on LinkedIn and Twitter, you can get me there. Um, and we just launched, well, it was launched two years ago by the CFA Institute UK, or the CFA Society UK, uh, an ESG curriculum. Uh, and it's, uh, they had me review it. I think it's very good. It's very thorough. Um, and, and, it, and it gives people a good grounding in, in ESG uh, analysis. And, and that, that's a good resource. But I, I want to warn people, it's, it's, a level, it's on the level of CFA, a CFA exam kind of study. You know, it's about that, that intense and that much information. Uh, so it's a great resource, but, it, but it's, it takes some dedication if you want to, want to go down that route. So I will, I will stop now and uh, hand things back over to most and, and, and let's have an interesting uh, conversation. I hope I, I look forward to uh, your questions and, and your conversation. Well, that was fantastic. I enjoyed it. And I think I, I learned quite a bit uh, myself. I did not know much, but I'm excited about more. Uh, everybody, I hope you're feeling the same way. Uh, it's a great time to start having uh, a, a question, your questions answered. So please feel free to speak up. Anybody, please, you could raise your hand and then we can give you the opportunity to speak. Uh, is there anybody, perhaps if we scroll into uh, Matt and perhaps what you think is the most important slide and then perhaps a slide can trigger a question or could do reverse engineering perhaps. I closed down my PowerPoint. Yeah, the, the, I think the, the, the circle one, the one with the- um, Yeah, I'll get that, hold on. The diagram. Uh, I, I think, um, I think we have a question here that says, would you say it's the norm for multi-billion dollar companies to audit, to audit their ESG reports? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh, would you say it is the norm for multi-billion dollar companies to audit their ESG reports? Yeah, that's an interesting question. We, um, 
we did a survey of our members back in 2015, and we repeated that survey in 2017. And one of the questions we asked was, <clears throat> should um, ESG data be assured? Should it be audited? Like, like normal mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. information. And most of the folks came back saying, yes, they thought it should be. Uh, and then we asked, you know, what, 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 that's not, you know, auditors cost money. It's not a free thing to do. So what's the value of that? How much should that be? And they, and, and I think it ended up about uh, a quarter to a half of the, of the cost of a normal audit that they thought it should be, that that's about how much they thought it, you know, it was maybe a quarter. You can, you can interpret that as it's about a quarter or half as important. It's the, the money people are looking to spend on it. I would imagine that number would be higher today. And I know that uh, the big four accounting firms are in a huge rush to hire folks uh, in the insurance, in the ESG assurance space. So it's, it's something that's starting. Well, it's already started, but it's something that's growing. And I would anticipate over time, as things like IFRS Foundation standards come out, as SEC standards come out, more policy and regulation comes around ESG data, you're just going to see more requirements and an ex expectation that it's assured. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, uh, and I, I think there will be demand for audited ESG data, yeah. right? The, the investors would want to see. I, I have received another interesting question. Is it possible to integrate ESG issues with cryptocurrency investments? And if so, how? I don't know. <laughs> that's a great, no, that's a great question. I, I, <coughs> I, I'm not uh, up on my crypto currency. I, I know enough to be dangerous, but I, I wouldn't want to give any people advice on it. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that's an interesting question. I, I would be interested in the answer as well, but I don't think I'm the person. The e there, unfortunately. Mm. Well, that was a hard question. Perhaps we can get another question from the audience. Um, I, I have not, um, I mean, this is my first presentation that I get on ESG. And, and my understanding is, I, I have to say, is in its beginning. Let me ask this question and perhaps I will get to ask in the end. Sure. As a finance student, can I have an advice? Hmm. Can you have one? And, and the, the question is, as, an, as a finance student, can I have an advice? Oh, she's asking you to give her an advice, knowing that she is currently <laughs> a finance student. I think, Marianne, I think that's the question. Yeah. What would your advice be to a finance student who's currently undergraduate? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm going to make the assumption that we're talking about ESG. Uh, correct, me if, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but it's really the same for, for anything in the... In the <clears throat> My answer is, is similar for any anything else. Um, I was often asked um, earlier in my career, uh, should I get you know, should I get an MBA or should I get a CFA? Uh, I I was foolish enough to get both. I got an MBA, and that led me to my CFA. One of my professors during my MBA studies was a CFA charter holder, and he used some of the CFA curriculum in in, in our classes and I thought oh that's interesting and that led me to the CFA um, and it's just, it's similar with ESG it's that you know what is your level of interest and what do you want to focus on um, and in ESG there it's the same with you know I, I, it's the same with you know should I take the CFA exam I think the CFA exam is a great resource but it takes a lot of time and effort uh, and it's a big investment of, of your time and mm -hmm. resources as well. And so you have to know that it's, that's going to be worth it for you and it's something you're really interested in. <clears throat> ESG, I, I, I've been in this ESG world a while and I've seen it develop. Uh, and it's, there's really so many different places you can go. 
uh, in ESG. You know, I mentioned that they had natural capital. If someone's interested in that world, that's really developing quickly. Uh, and I see a lot of opportunities in that in, in, in the coming years. Uh, but you know, from the bond side, from, from equity research to, uh, to uh, ratings firms and data providers, um, engaging with companies on ESG, uh, more and more companies are going to want to have <clears throat> and have people in house who are specialists in ESG. And that's gonna be different for different industries, of course. Uh, but there's really a lot of opportunities that are coming. And so at, as much as you can focus on what you want to do, what you know you like to, to do, there's, there's a lot of resources out there. Um, and uh, in the climate report I talked about in this presentation, you know, I read at the end of that report is, is two pages of, of resources of things just over the past year from last year when I came out and the year previous <clears throat> that I found useful and that I shared with folks. And of course, in the year after that, there's dozens and dozens of more. Yes. Uh, I, could, I, I could probably spend all my time reading ESG research and ESG reports and, and, not, and, have, and not have time to finish them all because there's so much out there. Uh, so there's not any uh, deficit of, of work to do, but there, it, is a lot of, it is a lot of work. And to develop the expertise, uh, I remember, uh, I think it was Malcolm Gladwell's book a couple of years ago about how, what it takes to become an expert on something. A lot. 10, like 10,000 10, hours of, of work, right? You know, that's, I find that probably to be about true. It's, a, you know, you put in the time and the research. Uh, and in ESG, there's plenty of different avenues to go down if that's where the question is going. Yes, and I think that's a, it's, it's a great answer. Although I have a follow-up question on that. Yeah. I'll get the chance for Sonia and Craig. And, and these are two questions before me and then I'll follow up on this one. Um, <laughs> Sonia is asking, thank you so much for the interesting presentation, agreed. Uh, the question is, um, there is any, or is there any way to involve students from universities in such research? So some of the research that you cited, and then uh, she, the question is, is there a, what is the CFA Institute on this regard? Is there any for uh, students to do some research on ESG related matters or issues? Yeah, yes. Uh, and again, it, there's going to be places where that's more easier to do than others. I've seen some universities uh, that have programs in, in sustainability or ESG at the graduate level, um, and some, you know, some that don't. But so if there if 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 there are places that you know have begun to specialize in sustainability or ESG or climate or natural capital as it, as it may be, of course it would make sense to gravitate to the, to those places. Uh, but as, as I said before, there's so much ESG is so vast and so broad. Uh, we just we started well, I, guess I started a, a podcast at CFA Institute called The Sustainability Story a couple months ago. And we're on our 10th, we just recorded our 10th episode. But the, the reason we're doing it is because ESG is so broad and so vast and we're never going to run out of topics to talk about uh, that if there's a topic you're interested and passionate about, uh, write about it, you know, probably with the, the approval of your professor if you're, if you're going you know, for a doctorate or something like that. Uh, but explore that and write about it and find find places that are, you know, doing research on that thing or, or that area uh, and start there. And, you know, there's plenty of groups, whether it's climate or natural capital or, or the S and ESG or governance-based organizations. There's plenty of those organizations around the world. Uh, and they're always happy to have new people join uh, and, and just get involved in those and, and you know, start your, start your 10,000 hours uh, as soon as you can. Absolutely. Uh, so, comp uh, so 
Uh, I'll, I'll go to the last question I have in the chat box. So companies determine what is material from, that's an interesting question. It says, com so companies determine what's material from their per perspective, correct? So isn't that completely open to manipulation? That's a great, that's a great question. And that's something we're in the materiality report where we're looking at right now. That's part of the discussion is we, we went around the world again, but this time virtually talking to, I think we talked to 70, 80 people, mostly investors around the world and what their views of materiality are and how they look at it and how they see it. Mm. But we talked to issuers as well. We talked to companies as well. And currently a lot of the regulation around the world in the US where I am is materiality is kind of defaulted to what the company thinks is material. That's correct. And that's and that's that's worked decently well, but if in some issues like climate, for example, uh, we're behind where we need to be. And I think in in some and that's part of the discussion with what's going on with the IFRS, what's going on with the SEC. I think what you'll see from the IFRS Foundation when they come out with disclosure standards, and they're starting with climate, they want to start with climate and then work on other issues. Uh, is they want to set a baseline of what's required. And that will, like, that will likely be scope one, scope two, scope three emissions. And then there are standards about uh, what, what that means, what the disclosure would look like. Uh, the Science-Based Targets Initiative is one. Uh, the UN has one, I forget what it's called. But I think there's three, there are three main ones. I'm, the other one's escaping me right now. But you'll see more standardization around those things where where voluntary disclosure hasn't done the job that investors need it to do. They don't get it quite. You're, not, you're not getting the materiality information you need. Um, and I, I listened to, there's a, there's a podcast, uh, I forget, I, I think it's the Sustainable Future uh, by um, the gentleman from the, um, Jason Mitchell from the Man Group. Uh, about a month ago, he did a talk with uh, um, the former acting SEC commissioner, oh, I forget her name, but uh, she was the commissioner before Gensler, who's, who's there now. She was the interim before Gensler came in. Um, and she was talking about, you know, that they're trying to understand how best to write rules around materiality of, of climate and other ESG issues. And it has been it's kind of the default of, of companies to decide what's material. But when it gets to the point where investors the preponderance of investors are asking and, and wanting certain information and they're not getting it from companies, then regulation policy has to step in to set that baseline. And then companies can differentiate themselves by providing more information or just go to that baseline. But that baseline needs to be set in instances like climate where investors are, are clamoring for more information and want more information than companies have been getting. Uh, that is a very interesting area of research. Uh, differentiation in the level of exposures, voluntary versus requirement, and to what extent <laughs> self-disclose. Um, that's beautiful. Uh, As, and, that, and just to follow up on that, that's one of the really interesting issues we're finding in, materi in, materi in our materiality discussions is there's going to be different issues that are just different in different markets. And one of the folks we're talking to uh, in Asia Pacific said that, for example, they use the SASB standards, but SASB doesn't really cover things like migrant labor that is, that, that is used a lot in the Middle East and Africa, but wasn't an issue where SASB was coming from. Uh, and there's mm -hmm. governance issues and environmental issues and social issues that are gonna be different in India than they are in Canada. They're gonna be different in Australia than they are in Italy. And so whether you have a baseline that some global organization like IFRS may, may set, you're always going to have local standards because the law is different in Japan than it is in Germany. Uh, the culture is different. Uh, the investment engagement culture is different. So there's always going to be that need for a local flavor to policy around ESG disclosures and what's material. And as we talked about dynamic materiality, that will change. That will evolve. That, that's right. And I am imagining a multinational op operating all over the globe 
the E and the S and the G, they will vary in their material materiality depending on where they are and determining yeah. what what level of exposure that is globally satisfying without getting them into disclose things they're not comfortable disclosing in some regions is, is going to be a very tricky decision. Right. And uh, take, for example, executive pay is, is a big issue. You know, if you're a big global organization, Japan like, is different from America. Yeah. You know, pay is, is so different in different markets. Take McDonald's, you know, a fast food company, you know, they have franchises all over the world and they have someone who's from a, an 18 year old learning how to cook fries to, you know, people in the headquarters outside Chicago. And how meaningful are those pay stats versus other companies in different industries that mm -hmm. operate in different markets? It's just, you know, investors. And, and that gets a lot to engagement. You know, I, I, I preach that, you know, both sides, investors and issuers should invest more in engagement so they can have these conversations so determine what's material to them and agree on that instead of... And only then disclose, is that your idea? To, to determine, have a discussion on what's material and once determined, disclose? Well, I think, I think in, 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 that, in that conversation also should be policymakers, right? So if, if, if uh, and being in this world for so long, there was more of an adversarial relationship between investors and issuers on a lot of these issues 10, 20 years ago. <clears throat> but I think they've learned that the more they discuss it, the more they can agree on what is material. They may, there's, there's always gonna be disagreement on I should disclose this or I should disclose that, or you know, they wanna keep more things close to the vest or not. But, you know, and, and things like SASB have helped kind of focus them on the, what are the 10 issues in this industry that matter the most or the eight issues or, the, or whatever that they are. Uh, and so I've seen that engagement improve in the past 10 years. And I think that's been useful. And I think that's led to a lot of talk about like for climate, for example, that's led to things like the IFRS foundation and the SEC considering uh -huh. new rules because there's, there's the conversations been going on between investors and issuers and that's bubbled up to the level where it's involving policymakers. But that conversation should always continue. So there's no surprises between an investor and an issuer about there's a concern from Black, BlackRock has a concern with what you're doing. They own a large stake of everything, right? Or or the Japanese pension fund, you know, so you know, the biggest pension fund in the world. And so you know, large companies increasingly need to have those lines of communication open with their investors, their larger investors. And it, I, I argue it's kind of, it's kind of a free consulting with your investors. You know, they're, they're, they're mostly indexed. They're going to be invested with you forever. Uh, and, and these are the things they're concerned about. And it's, and if they're unaddressed, it's going to bubble up to the level of policymakers where policy is going to be paid on it. And it's probably, it's probably better to, engage with your investors and find a solution to those things before it gets to the policy realm. Now, climate's unique and that, that's such a big issue. It's, it, that yes. it's always gonna, that's always going to be something that rose level of policy, but that's not always the case. That's a beautiful recommendation. I very much I agree. Uh, I will ask you one last question from the perspective of a student. Uh, sure. Perhaps a little bit different from this. So back to the ESG versus CFA. So a little bit on your path, MBA, CFA, and then later in the ESG. So, and we don't, we, I don't know many in, who would start a little bit different, meaning they, and the fact that you have two certificates, <coughs> that the CFA Institute has two certificates, doesn't mean that, that does imply or suggest that one is not an add-on. So is there a value to an order or a sequence? from a student perspective, does it make sense that one is uh, taken before the second, the other, which would not, normally you would think CFA and then couple it up with something that is, you know, flavor yeah. ESG, or just go ESG, but then 
But then, like, like you're mentioning, it's quite dynamic. So 10 years down the road, ESG, well, climate issues were resolved. Well, I'm, I'm too optimistic. But, yeah. and then, oh, but then finance is finance, and I lost all my CFA. So question. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, it starts with, you know, as much as, as much as you can, knowing, what you, knowing yourself and what you want and where your path is going, if you can. You know, that's not always the case. You know. um, I got my undergraduate degrees were English and communication film because that's what interested me. I'm nowhere near, I'm nowhere near that world now because this, my, my life has evolved in a different way. And I, at some point I went and got my MBA because that was going to be useful to me. I thought I needed that. And I accidentally stumbled on the CFA world and I said, oh, well, that's interesting. Let me, I think that could be useful to me as well. Um, and I focused on governance and ESG topics because that was of interest to me. Uh, I think like the ESG curriculum, I don't think it's really for me because I'm far along in my career and I'm established professional in that. Uh, and I don't think it's, and people know me in this world, uh, but I think it is, a, it is useful as a tool if someone knows they want to go into ESG and they want to be in the ESG world. I think it's a useful resource. And again, it's, it, it's, a, it's a lot of work, so it's not something to be taken lightly, just as the CFA is. I don't think people should worry about sequencing. Do I do this and this mm -hmm. and that? You, don't, you can take the CFA or the ESG curriculum without taking the CFA. If you take the mm -hmm. CFA, you, don't do the ESG. you can do the CFA instead of an MBA. You can do both. You know, MBA is a, is a broader understanding of what's going on in the business world and, and, and CFA curriculum is more focused if you know you want to do finance and you're going to be in the finance world. So it, it starts with knowing self, knowing, you know, know thyself, you know, as they say, as they say, uh, as much as you can. None of us will ever get there totally, I don't think. But knowing what, what you, what's best for you and your path, uh, and it may be none of those, it may be all of them, it may be one of them, it may be a different curriculum. Uh, there's a lot of offerings out there in the ESG world. There's some, there's climate specific. Yes. You know, SASB, SASB offers one, it's for someone who's using the SASB standards and it's useful for that. You know, there's some that are targeted towards uh, advisors who are talking to clients about ESG. Uh, the CFA one is, is, is more thorough, but it's more broad. So knowing knowing what you're looking for and then matching that with what's out there is what i would do okay. much to learn much to learn uh thank you so much we're up for the on the hour thank you so much it's been pleasure hosting you and uh i'm i enjoyed it so much and i'm on behalf of everybody i'm sure they did uh have a good day and uh, we'll catch up later thank you so much right. thank good you most thank you everybody take care you too